Okay. Well, hey everyone. Welcome to the Hope Adventure podcast. You guys Hello. can say hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've got, um, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, so we will start with you, Judith. Tell us who you are, where you're from, where you live now, a little bit about your relationship status. Great. Yeah. My name's Judith. I am from New Zealand. I've been living in Japan for four years and for the last nine months, I've been dating a Japanese guy. Awesome. All right. Phil. Hi everyone. My name is Phil. I'm from France. I actually work in Switzerland, but live in France. I'm a cross-border worker. I'm 33 years old and I'm single. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is David. I am from Switzerland and I've been living in Cambodia now in Southeast Asia for one and a half years. And I am 44 years old and I'm single. Awesome, and you guys know me, but I'm Bethany. I'm from Texas. I live in Texas right now. I am about to be 41 and I too am single. And I am so glad to have you guys on here as a panel. So David and I have been talking the last couple of podcast episodes just about singleness. You've just launched a book called Single for a Season. And those of us on this call are big supporters of you and the work that you've done and just believe um, in the empowerment of singles to live a life of abundance and thriving. So we have talked several times. We need to get a panel together. And so here we are, an international panel. It is 6 a.m. for Phil, 11 for David, one o'clock for you, Judith, and 11 p.m. for me. So um, we have already accomplished a huge challenge by getting on a call <laughs> all together across four time zones. But we're just going to jump straight in. And we want to invite you as listeners, just join us as we discuss, listen to what we're saying, think about your own answers, and hopefully we can encourage each other. So here is the first question right out of the gate. All of us are single, um, as in not married. And one of the things that David and I talked about a couple of weeks ago is the independence that we learn as singles. The older we get, the more independent we become. So how do you in your personal life guard against becoming too independent as a single? Anybody can jump in. I'm happy to start. <laughs> so for me, I awesome. think um, it's a great question. Like, it's really wonderful to be independent. And, you know, when you, uh, like most of us, we love traveling around the world. You learn to move overseas by yourself. I think we have to constantly make new friends, meet diverse people and learn to receive help from other people and not just um, do it on your own. Great. My take on that. Go on, David. My take on that is well, how do I keep um or my take on that is I try to plug myself into community, not doing life all by my own. Obviously, I love I love traveling, I love being independent. This is such a great advantage of being single, but at the same time, I'm very strategic about being part of a church community, having friends, even now as I'm living at the other side of the world, I constantly have Zoom calls with friends. So that's a way I stay or I I will not become too independent like that. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Phil? Yeah, for me, um, you know, I have a visualization board where I can picture my future life goals with my future wife and we're traveling all around the world um, so it helps me remember what is my end goal and it helps me be on track um, I, like David I also uh, keep a, a close circle of friends from church mm -hmm. I'm also on a dating app so I make sure that I'm always surrounded by people and I'm moving towards the right direction yeah, that's awesome. I love that. The visualization board and staying in community. I know for me, one of the things that's really important is serving others because sometimes independence can be 
um, rightfully translated as selfish and sometimes wrongfully translated as selfish. And so I know for me, um, that comes to the front a lot of time. I have a niece and nephews and I try to spend a lot of time with them because it keeps me not selfish. <laughs> so being on a schedule with kids and their needs and everything, um, they're super fun, but, um, also just serving people, giving, giving things, um, just out of the goodness and kindness, um, of my heart, hopefully sometimes, and not for any other reason, um, just to kind of get my eyes off self. So this question uh, that I'm going to ask now kind of follows into that are there rhythms or things that you are doing in your own life right now to prepare for a partnership with a spouse someday? So Phil, I may jump to you because you just talked about a visualization board. Um, I love that. I love that you're like keeping the vision in front of you. And the Bible talks about that people without vision perish. So you're keeping it right in front of you. And would you say that's one of your rhythms? Are there other rhythms that you have as well? Yeah, so the visualization board is, is one important thing, but then you need to take actions accordingly. Otherwise, it's just a dream that is unreachable. So mm. I try to develop morning routines and evening routines as well, where I take time to, to pray, to read, uh, to do sports, to, you know, to cook healthy food as well. It's not easy. It's not uh, easy to, you know, to be sustainable, to, you know, to, yeah. Sorry, I have to start again. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Um, yeah, for me, uh, the visualization board is one important thing, but... Ah, sorry again. That's okay. Um, That's okay. I can uh, edit it. Stressing a little bit, but... Yeah. Don't stress, just breathe. All right. So the visualization board for me is something that is very important, but you need to take actions accordingly. Otherwise, it's just a dream that is unreachable. So yeah. I try to develop morning routine, evening routines as well, where I can spend time with God, pray, read, also practice sports. It's not always easy to be disciplined, but I think it's really worthwhile and it helps a lot. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, what do you, what do you guys say, Judith and David? So for me, I feel... Like the morning, the first thought that comes on my mind, it's so important to rein that and give it to God. And he, for him to be the first on my mind every morning. And, you know, being in a relationship, you can start really not obsessing, but thinking a lot about that other person and you love them. But instead of picking up my phone and jumping on my phone and seeing like, has he messaged me or looking at social media? I really want it to be God because he's going to be always in my life. And I, re I really want to sow into that. And I think there have been many, many years where I've just made God my first love. And I just, even in a relationship, I just really don't want to lose that. So for me, that's really the only important rhythm in my life. I love that. That's so good. Your fir first love. I love that. Mine is a bit similar, like Phil's. I like vision too. And I wrote my five-year vision in my journaling book so the first page is where I want to be in five years and once in a while I just take it and just read it out loud and then I, I deal to detail what, what I want to do professionally and also family-wise relationship-wise how will that be and this is a way that helps me actually say okay that's that's my goal that's where I'm I want to go to and 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 it helps me to stay intentional about it because mm -hmm. being single sometimes it's difficult because you should not be miserable and you should not think about your status all the time but at the same time and this is what I want to do I want to be intentional and still make space for a relationship yeah that that you hit on a really good point because that what that brings up is the topic of balance which is what I was going to say for me as a rhythm like I, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to be a bit of a workaholic because I'm single and because I can work whenever the heck I want. And a lot of the work that I do is very fulfilling, but I also can hit a wall if I don't pace myself. And if I don't honor the Sabbath, and if I don't rest and take care of myself and do the things that make me feel alive and really connected to God, as Judith said, that's like the first thing too, is like making sure that um, my relationship with God is number one. And then I create space to spend time with him. 
But I think as we have rhythms to create space for someone that's coming in our life, hopefully down the road, um, it's important to take lessons that we're learning from life and realize that the things that we learn also can be applied to future relationships. So I'll just give you one really specific example. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with my dad and we were having a disagreement on something and I felt like the Lord, and it was a, it was a subject that was really important to both of us, but I felt like the Lord was inviting me to learn about submission, you know, by submitting to my dad, because he's my covering right now. I still am under the covering of my parents and instead of just being like, oh, I really don't want to do this thing or whatever. I just thought, you know what, like this is an opportunity to learn how to submit to someone um, and what they're hearing from God or what they're passionate about. And, you know, as my covering. And so for me, that was like a practical thing of like, I may need that in my future, hopefully, you know, at some point. So, um, but yeah, it's a matter of balance. And with that, um, a really Great. I think hard question popped up in one of our threads on Facebook. Um, we have this singles group that David hosts and here's the question. And I want to throw this out there for you guys. I don't think there's a simple answer. So I'm really curious what we have to say here, but what is the right balance between trusting God and letting him orchestrate your story and knowing when to take steps and to take action kind of on your own? Like what's the balance and just letting God do everything. And like, you just kind of sit on the couch, just like, you know, whatever, where's my spouse versus you out there, like trying to kind of like make things move forward. What's the balance? Personally, I think we should not force things. Um, for example, I should not always be looking at every girl at church or when I go to the street, I should let God really speak to me and tell me when is the right opportunity to, to move, to make a move. But at the same time, also, I, I shouldn't just stay at my place 24-7 uh, and hope that uh, my perfect <laughs> future wife will knock at my door and say, hey, Phil, <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you. Finally, I've been waiting for you. So, yeah. Hey, but that happens in movies. Why not? You know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I wish I had a, a ease, an easy answer to this. And uh, well, I've been wrestling with this question for a while and I still don't have the right answer. What I do know and what really helps me navigating that is I like the story of Nehemiah a lot. And there at one point, there was this danger coming, people attacking the city. And I love actually what he did. So he prayed, he prayed and asked God to help them, to protect them. And in the very same verse, right next to that prayer, he took, he picked up his sword and got ready and, and was protecting the city. And this helps me a lot. And I think there is this God part, the spiritual part God will do. And especially for me as a guy, I cannot just sit on my couch and doing nothing. That's probably not how I'm going to meet my wife. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> She's but, delivering your mail or something. Who knows? <laughs> exactly. But what I do know is whenever I pushed things too much and did the things on my own, it did not go well. And I think that's very important. There's something I learned just, just to be sensitive and to listen to my heart. Am I a piece or not? And especially, I think this is a word for you guys who are also a bit older. Let's call it seasoned single. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're seasoned single. The danger <laughs> is to force your destiny a bit. I don't mm -hmm. think that's a good thing to do. And even if you think you're not going to find anyone anymore because you're too old, I think God is still in control. And if it's right, God will give us peace. Mm, Amen. Yeah. Follow peace, follow peace. That's good. I've, I've been given that advice before. And I, I love just in lots of situations, it's like, you don't want to be where God is not get, giving you the peace. You know, none of us want to be in that spot. So Judith, do you have thoughts on that question? Yeah. I love this question. Um, 
like it's not just relationships it's career it's everything and you mm. know in proverbs 16 9 it says a man or woman plans his or her way but the lord directs his or her steps and his word really is our rock like we have to keep going back to it whenever we're unsure about little things and big things and i think the god is really clear like he wants us to be disciplined and make decisions, but also seek him. And he will close doors that we're not supposed to go through. Um, and just personally, right now, I'm in a relationship and I'm really seeking God. Is this the right man for me, God? Mm. If it's not, really close the door because I want God's protection now and forever. And he has protected me in the past from going too far in a relationship. And so my confidence comes from he will he will guide me um, and he will guide you too. anyone who's listening. I think if you are facing a decision, bring mm -hmm. it to the Lord, submit it to him. And over time, if, if it's not coming to you straight away, he will soften your heart to hear him because sometimes we don't want to hear the answer, but he does. If we really earnestly seek the Lord, he will answer. So just to leave everyone with a bit of confidence, like God doesn't leave us in the dark to figure it out on our own. Praise God. Yeah, that's so true. I love that. I love that. So so that I can know when to be spontaneous. And if I think about that in regard to anything else or relationships, it's kind of, it takes me back to your vision board, Phil, and just kind of having this target. For me, my target is not the perfect man who is this, this, and this. My target is God, whatever you have. So if that is a husband, yes, but ultimately it's really just the will of God. And it's really just the companionship with Jesus. And I believe that for anyone that is just walking daily with Jesus and has their eyes fixed on him, that at some point that person's just going to show up alongside of you on the path. And you're going to look around and go, Oh, this person's walking the same direction as me. And you know, that sounds magical and mystical. And maybe it's not always that simple, but um, you know, the point is just staying fixed on, on Jesus and, and asking him not, I think we're not good at asking God questions. Sometimes we're not taught to dialogue with God. We are taught to read his word or regurgitate like our to-do list, our need list. And, um, I know for me in the last two years, I've really learned how to ask God questions. Um, and I think that that's, that can be a big piece to this. Um, okay. Here's another question. Now this one could go in a lot of different ways. So feel free to take it wherever we all have needs. We are human. We have mental, emotional, spiritual, physical needs. How do you get your needs met as a single in those categories? Well, the first needs that comes into my mind is the relational need to be with people or to, it's, it's probably the emotional need. So what I do is spending time with, with other people, just to spend time deliberately with other people. Well, oh. David, you cut out. Sorry, guys. The That's okay. Let's pray for a good internet. Yeah, in please, Jesus. We need good internet in Cambodia because it's all riding on this recording. Um, David, if you'll just pop in and um, so let me, I'll just, um, well, just go ahead and start saying what you're saying because it just totally cut out when you start talking. Okay. The first need that comes into my mind is the relational needs. I'd say the emotional need. What I do is I, I'm very strategic and very deliberate to spend time with other people, with friends and other, sometimes families, 
or just in a, in a larger uh, group of people to not do life alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Not doing life alone. I'll take yeah. a stab at a, um, like an awkward topic Christians don't like to talk about, which is around meeting your physical needs. Um, you know, I have been waiting until marriage to have sex and that is not easy. I don't think it's any easy for anybody. Maybe it's harder for some people than others, um, especially maybe if, you know, those listening have been in a sexual relationship in the past and then they've, you know, felt convicted and they've had to sort of stop. And, and I think that's awesome, you know, praise God for that. Learning um, what the word says. I mean, I'm not gonna preach right now about this area. I think everyone really, you need to go on the internet, really seek what other teachers around this area say about meeting your physical needs as you as you wait for marriage. Um, but I, as a, as a woman, I think avoiding too much romantic novels or movies, which encourages the sense of feeling loved. Um, mm. That's really important. And also exercise can help like just bring balance into your body. And I think knowing that your body is going through changes physically and that God, he created us, you know, to have children. And so we all have our different physiological changes, but, you know, as a Christian, learn what the Bible says about these things and seek God's help as you, as you wait for your, your husband or wife. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for going there to that hard topic that most people don't like to talk about. That's um, a really good, a really good uh, answer, Judith. I like it because this is a, a tough question, and I I was wrestling with that one too. Also, when I was writing my book, it's like, what can I give you, uh, give as an answer? But it, it's a real physic, it's a real need, it's a real challenge. And what I love, I love what you said about the movies, and I think it's a bit similar what to what I do. I I, I really realize that, that it's a, um, that it's about my thoughts. I really have to control my thoughts and not consume things that make me feel miserable or make me feel alone or, or, or looking at all those relationships that are amazing. It's like, I want to have it. Like it's, it's a healthy, it's kind of, it's, it's like finding a healthy balance in that and not, mm starting this negative mind thing going because then it, yeah it's very difficult yeah I think those are both really good points I know for me um I'll be careful how I say this but um I feel like and David you and I talked about this a little bit on the last podcast but like our bodies were created by God and one of the things that I've been learning this last year is to really listen to my body. I'm not naturally, I'm very much like a head person. I don't know if you guys know the Enneagram. We use that a lot in spiritual direction. I'm an Enneagram seven. I'm like all the experiences, all the things, and I'm always in my head and my natural inclination in processing and discerning is to go into my head. And then my second, um, space is my heart space. And then my third one is my body, my gut, my intuition kind of piece. And I've really been learning how to listen to God in the way that he speaks to me through my body. And that sounds maybe a little bit weird, but it's, he created us. So it's like, when we are hungry, we have a hunger pain. Um, when we're thirsty, we're physically thirsty. And so there's been moments when um, I would sit with God in his presence and I would have just like overwhelming physical sensations in my body. And I would say, God, what is that? And he's like, I just want you to know I'm here and that I can meet you in a physical way. And obviously it's not, it's not the same as, you know, a sexual way. Um, but it's, it's our creator. God has created us. He's in us. He's all around us. Um, he knows our bodies better than we do. He knows our needs. He knows our physical human needs. And I believe that he can even meet us in the physical ways that we're created for. Um, it may look, feel, be different than what the world tells us, um, as singles, but, um, you know, Judith, I love just what you said of like the values of just, um, yeah, just, you know, sex inside of a relationship that when you're married and God created that, you know, but it doesn't mean he's depriving us 
just because we're single, you know, and can't express that part of ourselves. Um, and he's creative. God is creative. So, um, Phil, did you have anything you wanted to add about needs, you know, on, at any level, emotional, physical, spiritual, mental? Yeah. I would like to drop on what David said about the thoughts that Mm -hmm. you have. Uh, it's very important to, you know, to, to really be aware of the negative thoughts that you keep repeating on a daily basis. The, the brain naturally does, does that. Um, and it reminds me of a, a verse, I think it's in John 10, chapter 10, verse 10, which says the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I came so that you may have life to the fullest. Mm. That's what Jesus said. And, and it's very important to remind you this verse when you're either feeling lonely, when you feel your needs are not met, uh, you need to, to really remember this, this powerful message. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I know for me, I have a, I have like an identity statement that I have sat with the Lord and really asked him, you know, who do you say I am? What do you say about my life? And I keep that in front of me. And so that's kind of part of one of my rhythms, but what that does is it, it combats the, um, the lies that the enemy speaks over me. So when I feel inadequate or when I feel like I'm missing out, especially David and I've talked about FOMO a lot, you talk about it in your book quite a bit. Um, I have to remind myself, no, this is who God says I am. And these things are lies. And sometimes I physically put it in front of me. Like it's like written on a card. Um, and I think that combats the lies and it replaces it with the truth of God's word, because so much of what's on my identity card really comes straight out of scripture. Um, and so I think that's, I think you guys are really onto something when you're talking about, um, a lot of these things are around our mindset and the way that our, you know, taking, taking captive our thoughts, which Jesus tells us to do in uh, scripture. So. Um, okay. We're going to move on to another topic. This one is really around our relationship with our married friends. Um, so I asked a couple people to contribute questions of things that they want to know about singles. And, um, I had some people ask. So the first question I want to ask is, are there things that you have noticed as a single? Okay. So first of all, let me back up. I want you to picture a friend, a close friend, who has, who was like your running buddy in singleness. And then they met someone and they got married. I'm pretty sure we all have somebody in mind, right? Or at least know sort of somebody. Okay. Think about that relationship with that person and think about, is there anything that that person in that transition period from singleness to marriage, is there anything that they began to do that kind of made you feel isolated or caused tension in your relationship with that person. I'm not saying intentionally, like, it's not like they're like, Oh, now I'm going to make you feel left out. Cause I'm getting married and you're not, but thinking back, have you guys had that experience where you kind of, it was a hard transition with a friend who went from being single to being married. I see some of you nodding your heads. <laughs> I know I've had that several times actually yeah i have uh, my best friend we've known each other for maybe 20 years now we grew up together he's like a brother for me and he's been dating a girl for a few years now and what i realize is that his availability has been shrinking every day um, even last weekend we were supposed to have a call but in the end he couldn't because he was organizing a dinner with his his girlfriend. And yeah. I hear. Anyone else? Well, yes. <laughs> it's funny, Phil. It's the same word that came into my mind: availability. <laughs> and I would add a second one, it's flexibility. <laughs> and um, well, it, it happened to me actually several times and mostly with the, with the buddies that we were hanging out in my early 20s or late 20s. 
Oh, I was very blessed having a great group of people. We did all kinds of different stuff. But as everyone got married except me, <laughs> um, it was it's kind of the dropout game, you know, like they just would not come anymore or they just are busy or no, sorry, I, I can't come to this party because I already have other commitments. And this was very painful because uh, I eventually I ended up spending my weekends alone. Yeah. When I read this question, Bethany, I kind of read it almost backwards of like how as singles, can we be happy for those as they enter into their marriage season? Um, you know, and I, for the past few years, have kind of had a little Facebook messenger group with single ladies. And then when when someone's got gotten married, I've just started a new group with new people. And I've always thought like, I just really want to use my time to encourage those who need encouragement and not dwell on those who are, you know, maybe don't have enough time for me because there are so many singles. Um, and so there's, there are plenty of friends for me who have time for me and I want to have plenty of time for them. And I also really, I never want any bitterness in my heart um, towards, towards those who move on into marriage. Um, and I, I totally know it's easier said than done. I mean, when you go to so many marriages, um, like wedding ceremonies and you're still single and you see more and more people marrying, you feel like you're the last on the, on the list. Um, I think it's just constantly looking around and seeing that there are others who are also in need and it's about love, right? The love deficit. Um, and when you just pour out, I just feel like naturally God mm -hmm. just gives you the relationships and the things that pour back in, um, into you. So I hope that doesn't contradict anything, but just that you can look at this from another positive, Hey, what can I yeah. do to sow into others? Which is exactly what David's been doing, right? Like, yeah, it's great. No, I love that you read the question. So my friend asked me that question and she had a hard time putting it into words. She even explained it to her husband and he was like, I don't really get what you're trying to ask. So she and I verbally processed it. And I was like, I think I get what you're, you're getting at, but the conversation that ensued, cause she was like one of my very best friends. And I was really honest with her. And I said, you know, for me, there was kind of a moment that was very difficult because we were living in Switzerland and we were like, side by side. We were conquering the world together. They called us the dynamic duo. And the first time that I was with her and her, her husband, who I love dearly. And I always have a joke where I tell them, I can't wait to grow old with you guys. Um, and it's kind of like our inside joke or whatever. Um, but I do remember thinking, wow, this used to be like my space with her. So to go back to what you guys said about availability and flexibility, and then all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, I have to share her with a person who actually is now her priority and should be her priority as a human being. But like, dang it, now I feel a gap, you know? And I think one of the things that she said to me is she goes, she said, I don't think I realized that I was gaining a relationship. And at the same time, you were losing one. And I think that for me, ultimately for me, the hardest thing about that transition is the grief because anytime we lose anyone, we have any change, there's grief attached to it. And so what's really cool about what you just shared, Judith, is that one of the biblical prescriptions for grief and lament, okay, not, not to move past it too quickly and just ignore it but to celebrate and to praise and to thank God. And so instead of sitting in that wallowing, oh, I'm spending another Friday night, another Saturday night by myself, you know, just praising God for who he is and what you do have and the season that you have had with that person. Um, that's something that's been really helpful for me, but I love the different angle on it. I think both sides are important and I always want to celebrate my friends. I never want jealousy or envy to take over something that could be a gift of joy to that person, like a celebration of them, because I, you know, we are celebrating our friends as they move into what they want and have been desiring. Um, okay. What are, what are some practical ways that our married friends and family can support us? Now we can flip that around just like you did, Judith. Um, some of these questions came from my married friends who were like, please tell me, 
Um, but we, we can flip it around too. So have you, however you guys want to answer that, what are some ways that your married friends have been helpful to you, included you in things, you know, whatever that looks like. I'm very thankful for married friends who who are encouraging me. I think encouragement is such a powerful thing. And especially many singles, including myself, we have felt weird at times and asking a thousand questions, what is wrong with this? And it's it's just the word of encouragement made such a difference and just helped me to to just keep going and, and believing again. Yeah, and also um, what I really like from my friends is when they, you know, when they suggest that I meet some person, we all know single people around us, right? But mm-hmm. as Christians, we're always shy to introduce people to each other. And sometimes we shouldn't put too much pressure on ourselves. We should just go and organize something and, and see how it goes. So I really appreciate when some of my friends uh, introduced me to, to new people. Uh, perhaps it could work out sometime. And speaking about encouragement, I think prayer is is also important because I have a couple of friends. Um, they not only they pray for me, but they also proactively come back to me a few weeks later and say, "Hey, how is it going? Can I pray for some specific topics? Have you have you seen any improvements so far?" Um, I think catching up with friends and keeping that relationship is is really important. So what I hear you saying is you want your married friends to be your matchmaker. (laughs) (laughs) That would be really great. Yes. And because these people love you and they know you, that's how I feel. I'm like, come on people. Don't you have single friends somewhere? Like, hello. (laughs) Um, I love what you said, um, Phil, about the prayer. One of the things I was going to say, and then Judith, I'd love to hear your response on this as well, but, um, I intentionally a couple years ago was like, you know what? I have a lot of girlfriends praying for my future husband. What I didn't have was a lot of guy friends. And so what I started doing is inviting my really close, like soul friends is what I call them. Um, their husbands into prayer for my husband, because I felt like there was a power in having a man that knows me well through his wife. Cause we're really good friends um, pray. And what it's done is it strengthened my relationship with the husbands. Um, and, and, and they speak something into my life that is so valuable. Like this, the, this couple I was talking about earlier, I, I tell them all the time. I want to grow old with them. Um, my friend's husband, he's spoken so many prophetic words over me in praying for my husband and over my life, along with my friend that like, I just cherish and hold dearly. And they come from a man's perspective being a man who was once single and this particular couple, they, they were older when they got married as well. And, um, I've just found that really powerful is to invite men. So for you guys, maybe to find, um, married couples and you just really say to the women, like, Hey, I need you to pray for my wife. That's coming, you know? Yeah, that's great. And I love the encouragement point, um, David, you were make, making earlier. Just affirmation is so important for singles. And so if you can encourage, even, you know, focus on something physical, like, hey, you have great legs. You know, obviously girl on girl with this way to approach that. <laughs> focus on something that's really going to affirm them. I mean, I've said to both Phil and Dave, I think um, I've known them for, for a few years now. Like, I think I've both said to them at separate times, Hey, you, you're a total catch. Um, and it's just like reaffirming. And I totally mean it. It's nice to hear, Hey, actually, like I've got something good going on, you know, or if, if, you know, you, your friend tells you, you've got, you know, great hair or great legs, you're like, wow, you know, I'm not an attractive person. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with me. And, and I think sometimes those thoughtful affirmations, um, which just recognizes like how God has blessed you and it doesn't have to be physical. It can be on personality. It's really nice. And it just reminds you, Hey, I've got great value. There is no reason why, I'm still single because I'm not more attractive or, or whatever. And I think, yeah, that, that would be my practical advice to, to married friends. Gosh, that is so good. Cause we all know encouragement goes a long way. 
I hadn't thought about that before as like a practical thing, but I think it is true because there have been times in my life when, you know, I've, I, I kind of jokingly say like, I have a list of my friends and I kind of rank their husbands in the order of who's my favorite and who's not, (laughs) it's not totally true. I would never reveal the order of the list to anyone. Um, but part of it is, you know, just, just the friendship that I have with these married couples as well. And, and part of that is because their affirmation of who I am as a person. And as David talks about a lot, like it makes me feel less weird about my singleness. It just kind of makes me feel like a celebrated person that people love and want to be around. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm married or not, you know, but it, we all need encouragement. It doesn't matter who you are. We all need encouragement. So just for what it's worth, everyone on this call is stellar. So thank you for <laughs> being who <Thank> you are. <laughs> Thumbs up. Um, okay. This next question is, um, Again, I don't know. I'm curious to see what you guys are going to say to this because I don't think it's an easy answer, but how do you become okay with being single? Like, how do you come to terms with your singleness, especially, you know, if you're older, you know, well, most of us on this call are older, you know, we're not 20. Um, What's your journey been like? to just be okay with the season that you're in. Really quick point for me is um, life is going fast, right? I mean, we are not going to be married in heaven. And we get sometimes so caught up. I feel like living on earth is kind of just the dress rehearsal for the real thing when we're going to be in God's presence and we're not going to be married or focus on who we married or what, you know, level of romance we had. And so it's okay if we never marry. It's okay. Life goes fast. We can have some great times here. Um, keeping eternity in your mind. Maybe this is not a popular perspective for most people, but if we dwell on the spirit, we will grow. But if we dwell on the flesh, we'll, you know, the word talks about how that doesn't lift us up. So I think focusing on eternity, that your spirit is going to be with God forever, that that's where you get encouragement that, hey, no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. Mm, I love that. What made the big difference in my life, or, or did, I'd say that, let's call it like this, it's, it, it, start again. <laughs> The turning point in my life was when I finally let go. It's something that hmm. took me a few years actually to, to get that point to that point. But hmm. when I finally did tell God whether I'm gonna marry or not, I'm okay with it, everything changed. And my desire to get married did not go go away. I'm st- I still have this desire. But we've talked about that before, Bethany, but I'm okay with it. I'm not just kind of okay with it. I'm really okay with it. And I love what you said, Judith. It's sometimes we're too focused about about marriage and finding the one, but there is so much more in life than that. So David, I just want to clarify, um, because I think, I think we've all wrestled with this. Like when you say I'm not just kind of okay with it. actually really I was mentioning negative thoughts earlier Mm -hmm. Um, one negative thought that I had for a long time was the fact that I was cursed because I was still single in my 30s and this Mm. is a a big lie right Mm. Uh, and one thing that it was really important actually was to to join this the singles group that david mm-hmm. created this uh, single influencer community 
because in the end you see a lot of people in the same situation as you and then you start to realize that you're you're just a normal person we're the so fun the group power. on the internet <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's really good i love that um david i was asking you to dig deeper into being okay um you you talked about being okay like kind of okay but then no you're really really okay can you like walk me through that a little bit i think i know what you mean because i i would kind of use similar language but tell me about what it was like when you were just kind of okay what did that mean well i was saying that i was okay but when i listened to my heart i was not and i constantly was thinking of how could I find the one or what should I do there probably pretty much every day I was just trying to meet or trying to look into other singles group or anything it was just something that was there it was it was kind of a goal and now what has changed is even though I still have this desire it's not my priority anymore it's Mm. it's still obviously I still want to be available I still want to make space but I'm not just living for that uh, it's and you you mentioned it earlier Judith it's it's a it's it's about seeking God first and mm -hmm. often we say we seek God first but then when we look at our action and intentions actually it's not really the case and that was before because my first love quote love was or my first priority was finding someone which is wrong which is an idol and now i still have the desire but it has taken another position position it's not number one in it anymore it's i don't know maybe it's number two no probably not it's maybe mm -hmm. even further down the list now but it's 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 a priority thing hmm. i love that i love the I hadn't thought about it that way. Cause for me, like, I remember, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but I, I had so many people that used to, to act like in their advice that it, that there was a formula to singleness and to marriage. Meaning if you just don't worry about it, you'll meet your husband. If you just give it to God and if you just don't think about it and if you just, you know, and again, we kind of talked about that earlier. I mean, I was talking about keeping your eyes on Jesus, but the difference in me saying that, and when I heard that back then is because I said to myself, okay, well, then the formula is just not worrying about it, but my motive in not worrying about it didn't actually let the worry go away. It actually created it more. So I was only not worrying about it to expedite the process of meeting my husband, because I, it was like, I was doing a formula, like, okay, I'm not going to worry about it equals I'm going to meet my husband. <laughs> um, and now I have completely been like, my motive is not to expedite the process. My motive now is whatever God's will is. Um, and kind of to your point, David, it's, it's a matter of priority. And I know for me, I was at a retreat, um, I was at a retreat, I think three years ago, and I was talking to a woman, she was older and she got married later in life. And we were just talking about singleness. And she was asking me about my journey with that. And did I want to be married and all this stuff. And I remember I had this like crazy moment with God where he said to me, Hey, Bethany, if you knew everything you had to sacrifice to be where you are today, would you do it again? And I was like, I would. And I told him, I said, it's, I would give it all up again. I would walk the exact same road to be where I'm at today, where my heart is for the Lord and for, for God's presence and who he is, because he's my best friend. He's my companion. Like he is the love of my life. And it was a really poignant moment. Cause I just, I mean, I was bawling. Cause I was like, wow, I really, really desire, I would give it all up again. And for me, that was a shift. That was like a total radical, okay, I'm no longer letting it go. 
to fill in the box just so that it can expedite my husband. I'm now letting it go saying, I, I don't want it if that's not what you have. Um, so yeah. You guys have any other thoughts about that? I know that one was a big question or even anything else um, we've talked about. I have one more question I want us to land with, but any other comments or advice or encouragement? Yeah, there is also something that helped me to accept that being single is, is can be a good thing in the end because I've seen many people around, you know, around me that are that have rushed to be in a relationship and that haven't spent time to, to mm -hmm. choose the right person or they haven't spent time to really ask God, is that the right person for me? Uh, and they have made big mistakes in the end and they are not living a fulfilling life today because they, they just wanted to be with someone for the sake of not being single. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would really want to encourage people to, to really not take this decision because you don't want to be single anymore, but really because God has showed you, has spoken to you that this is the person you should marry. That's great. That's such a good reminder. It reminds me of what Judith was talking about earlier, just in her own relationship, seeking the Lord and asking for his protection. I mean, I feel like the story of my relationship life is that God has protected me from so much. And I am so thankful for that because at the time I didn't see it that way. It was heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak, but I can look confidently now and say that the Lord protected me. Um, and I had dinner with a friend uh, a couple of nights ago, a childhood friend of mine, and she and I were talking about this topic and she said, you know, Bethany, even in marriage, it's lonely. And it can be lonely because we, we talk about loneliness. Sometimes we haven't really talked about that tonight um, on this podcast, but she was just saying, the thing is, is we're, we're all single to an extent. She's like, I'm single. I'm married to my husband, but I'm still myself. I have to still figure out who I am and what I'm about. And I think at the end of the day, it all comes back to this companionship with Jesus. Like I know people who are really lonely in a marriage. And I know singles that are really lonely and the solution, in my opinion, is being so connected to God that, you know, that he's with you, he's for you. He promises he will never leave us or forsake us. And, um, I had an encounter one time when the Lord just had me look at a wall of postcards of all the places that I've lived in around the world. And he said, Hey, what do you notice about each of those places? And I said, well, they all have something that's like pointing up like the Eiffel tower and the Matterhorn. And, um, you know, in Cape town, there was a Cape mountain, can't remember the table, tabletop mountain, all the things. And, um, he said, I was reminding you that I was with you in every place. And I always talk about God is with us every second of every day of every week of every year of every moment of our entire life. Um, and really that's what it's all about. So do you guys have any other comments or shall I move to the last question? I just was going to think about um, adding worship into a suggestion of being okay with being single and worship is just such a he healing. It's like a shower for your heart. So just, you know, like seeking, seeking God through worship is such a beautiful way just to connect and plug into him and treating your Bible like you would social media, kind of jumping to it so automatically when anxiety comes, because anxiety comes to us, right? We're like, oh, we're still single, time's running out. Oh, I'm a female, I should have babies, blah, blah, blah. Anxiety just blows out. You just got to quickly run to worship, quickly run to the word. Um, yeah. Mm. I love that. So practical and so good. Okay. Well, I want to land here with this question. So this is the Hope Adventure podcast. And I usually like to ask people that I chat with on here this question. But what does hope mean to you in your single season? Um, for me, I... Um, read this question and Psalm 37 just really quickly paraphrasing it 
you know, it says, trust in the Lord, delight in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to him and he will do this. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not worry. It only leads to evil. Hope for me is, is waiting on God's best. I know he's got the best for me. Mm. So good. Thank you. Hope for me is that God is here. I'm not alone. And we read it in Matthew when Jesus came God sent the Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. And this was such a eye-opening moment when I realized that, that I'm never alone, even if I feel lonely. And especially in this pandemic, sometimes it was, it was very lonely, but I was never alone because Jesus is always with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I'm thinking about my uh, vision board that I was mentioning earlier. And, mm -hmm. you know, this dream is coming from God, this dream of being married and having a family. Um, so if it comes from God, then he will definitely find a way to make it happen one way or the other. So I'm um, really rest assured that uh, things will work out. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder that God is the author of our love stories not just our love stories and our relationships, but our love story with him. He's the author of all things. Um, and for me, that gives me a lot of peace and a lot of hope, um, a lot of confident expectation that he is good and he is always faithful and he has the best in mind. So um, yeah, these are things that are important for us to remember. I want to end with kind of a little bit of a weird... Um, a, a weird glimpse of hope, I would think maybe, but, um, I, I'm very close to my niece and my nephews and my nephew, one of them is six. And the other day I was talking to him and, um, he and my mom had had this conversation about me and she said, Hey Jack, why don't you tell Juby? That's my aunt name. Um, why don't you tell her what we decided about you not being married or about her not being married? And I was like, hold on, why are you having conversations with the six-year-old about my relationship status? And he was like, oh, I don't want to tell her. I don't want to tell her. And I was like, well, is it that because I'm not married, I can spend a lot more time with you? And he just like lit up and started giggling. And like, that was the answer, you know? And so I just was reminded from like a six-year-old's perspective of how he sees me. Um, and I think it was later that day I said, hey, Jack do you want to get married when you're older? And he looked at me and he goes, no, Juby, I don't want to get married. I want to um, be just like you. I don't need to be married. And I was just like, whoa, that's uh, just was so touching. And I had a 13 year old say that to me. Um, that's part of my story recently. I had a 13 year old say that to me when I was in Maui, she was like, if you were married, you couldn't travel the world and do what you do. And for me, that's just the joy and the beauty of it. And I, I finally have shifted my perspective to see singleness as a gift and a calling even, and maybe it's not a lifelong calling for all of us, but it's a calling right now where we are. It's part of our calling. And so let's serve God well in it. Let's give all we have to it. Um, and you guys are doing that today. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for waking up early for us coordinating this crazy four time zone conversation. It's been really encouraging for me. And I pray that it's been a blessing for you guys as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Much. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Awesome. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>